<laughs> Sorry, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll talk louder when the presentation starts. Just, just give me a minute. Um, Sorry for the delay. I have a question. Yes. What is that thing that I use? Here? That is called a domo. It's it's, uh, it's a Japanese plush toy, and it is hilarious because it can't close its mouth. That is why it's funny. <laughs> <laughs> All right, hold on. Let me switch. All right, we'll, we'll try and get the laptop working, but in the meantime, uh, you guys don't really care about video that much. Uh, we'll, we'll switch over to the tablet, which is a tablet. All right, so uh, what I'm basically what I'm going to go over today, um, huh, I was just going to go over robots, but then I was like, eh, it doesn't have anything to do with space directly. So I figured I'd go over design. So one of the uh, most important things you do uh, when you go into space or when you're building robots is design them, uh, spaceships or robots. Um, I do both, or at least I used to do the first one. I do more of the second one now. So uh, what I do right now, um, I work on the transporter erector at SpaceX. So the transporter erector uh, is very important. Uh, it, it, it holds the rocket gently and, uh, and lifts it up on the pad. It's this big thing back here. Um, weighs on the order of uh, 100,000 pounds and, and it's pretty big. Um, right now we're working on a bigger one uh, up, up in Vandenberg, pretty sweet, uh, Falcon Heavy, right? Um, on the order of millions of pounds, so um, it's it's an interesting design problem. Uh, it's you, your rockets generally aren't meant to be sideways; they they want to be vertical. Um, they're really good at taking compression loads uh, vertically, but they're not so great at being bent. Uh, and we kind of have to stop that from happening and manage to get them pointed up. Uh, can't launch them at 45 degrees, unfortunately. That'd be really sweet. Um, so. I would show you this video, which is really awesome, and it's the thing we're pulling out, but I don't think it's going to work. All right, so we'll just go ahead and skip on to the next slide. So what I've done, um, what I used to do before I started working on space stuff, uh, I worked on robots. So this right here is called Charlie. Uh, it's, a, it's a humanoid robot. It weighs about 40 pounds. It can walk for about 30 minutes before uh, the batteries run out. It's uh, lithium polymer batteries. Uh, it runs on a on a Windows machine, runs on a Linux machine. Um, there's reasons for that. Uh, but yeah, so basically the, the way, uh, what we, I, I went to Virginia Tech, uh, it's a school in Virginia, kind of out in the mountains, beautiful place. Um, and at Virginia Tech, we were interested in developing a full-size humanoid robot, kind of uh, as America's foray into the, into the tech, into that specific technology. Um, might, a lot of you might say, you know, why humanoids? Um, it's really the form factor and, and being able to do things that people can do. Um, so if, if you look at, say, a Roomba, it, doesn't, it looks kind of like a hockey puck that rolls around and, and vacuums your floor. And that's really nice. Um, I will say that you don't want one of these guys vacuuming your floor because it's not gonna work very well. Um, the, the technology isn't quite there yet to where you can do useful tasks like that with full-size humanoid robots. Osimo can pick up bread and move it to another table. Um, just to give you an idea of where the field is, um, you can do very, very simple tasks, uh, you know, using simple tools, things like that, you know, pick up a drill, screw a, a drill into a board. It's a very complex task because what a, a robot like this is, it, is, is a complex kinematic chain. So basically, you start at the ground, and you've got your feet on your ground. In this case, we have flat feet because flat is easy. Um, and then going up the chain, you have a bunch of servo motors that, that uh, define each joint. Now this is very different from the way your body works. Uh, you have a skeletal structure which has similar joints to this one, but you, your your bones don't have little motors at, at, at each joint. Uh, you actually your muscles are a parallel actuator that kind of wraps around uh, the structure and then actuates around the joint using tendons. Um, and there are similar architectures to this in humanoid robotics, but they're only now starting to get to where they're practical in terms of being able to walk. And, and interact with things. Um, and there's a significant advantage to parallel actuation. Uh, you get a much stiffer structure and you can carry a lot more load. So you can get closer to doing what human things can do. Uh, something like Osimo or Charlie here, uh, very frail. Uh, it weighs on the order of 40 or 50 pounds and that's really because you're maxing out the amount of torque that a, that a servo motor that's the size to fit into a profile that's similar to a human. You're maxing out the amount of torque that you can get out of a servo motor that big. Um, we actually use 
probably the most advanced uh, hobby sized servo motors in the world are called uh, Dynamixels, made by a company called Robotis. Um, and they're kind of expensive. Uh, standard hobo servo motor, motor costs like 50 bucks, 60 bucks. Uh, these cost about 500 a piece. Um, they use really fancy Maxon motors um, to, to drive. But the, the thing about Charlie um, that's very interesting um, in terms of, of cost. Uh, so, so you, you might be familiar with Osimo as, as a similar humanoid. Uh, it, it, it has slightly more capability. It, it's a little more precise than our design, but it costs uh, on the order of a thousand times to ten thousand times more. Um, ours was about twenty thousand dollars for the whole construction. Um, the Honda Osimo costs about two hundred million dollars in development, and it took them about twenty years to make it. So, if you look back to the nineteen eighties, is when they started. Uh, they started with a pair of legs. Um, it was actually a really nice pair of legs. Um, and then they, <laughs> they, they put a box on top of it um, to simulate like an upper body and torso, and then they put a bigger box on top of it, and they kept putting bigger boxes on top of it until they decided to put arms and, and a head on top of it. The arms and head really are kind of unnecessary. The, 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 the real thing you're doing is researching uh, different ways of making the legs, because that particular type of locomotion is what you're interested in. You want to be able to traverse a lot of different types of terrain, uh, and be able to, you know, like maneuver over them. Um, so, you know, that that's kind of the Charlie project. It, it's just kind of a foray into that specific, specific technology field um, at our school. And so we built that in a year, um, kind of fast. It shows you how technology is moving towards this. It's uh, much easier to build things like this nowadays. Uh, computers and all that stuff. It's, it's great. Um, so the thing over on the right is actually called Raphael. It's, it's a robot hand. It's very similar uh, design, uh, design, you know. We, we wanted it to be similar to Charlie in that it's very inexpensive. Uh, the closest thing on the market is called the Shadow Hand, and it's, it, it runs on pneumatics, it's, it's air powered, and it uses um, these cool actuators that we developed that are kind of like a bendy straw inflating, and they cause it to, the fingers to wrap around things. Um, so the Raphael robot hand costs about 100 to 200 bucks to make. Um, Whereas the closest thing on the market is about 20,000. So you can see when you start getting into to lower cost points like this, you can do really cool stuff because you can throw your stuff away. You can throw it at some a problem that you know it's going to get destroyed and it's not really that big a deal. Um, so the Raphael Robotic Hand was, was actually a project that we did for a competition um, called the Compressed Air and Gas Institute's uh, Innovation Challenge. And the idea was to come up with a design study of a way to apply compressed gas uh, to an industry specific problem or just a, you know in any interesting uh, application and to do it um, in a cost-effective manner so we came up with this hand uh, this was the first revision it's laser cut out of acrylic and then we potted the actuators ourselves and there's some solenoids on there um, an interesting thing it's transparent so you can kind of see what you're doing easier with cameras you can look through the hand to see things um, that wasn't really intended, but it ended up working out that way. Uh, it's entirely made of laser cut plastic and it's modular, so you can pull the fingers out and place them really easily. Um, another <coughs> cool thing about it, um, like I said, it's super cheap. Uh, we could remake the whole hand in about a day. Um, they're very easy to produce. Um, and they can do uh, very simple grasping tasks. In this case, it's holding uh, my ancient phone. It uh, gives you an idea of, of how old. The, this particular version of the hand is. The second version of the hand, uh, called Raphael 2, we added a closed loop control system. So basically what it can do there is it can determine how much force it's exerting on something and decide whether or not it needs to grasp something stronger or weaker. It also has a rough idea of where its fingers are. So when you want to, say, say you have an object on the table in front of you, you want to grab it, you have, need to have some idea of where your hand is when you're, when you're going to grab it or else you could knock it over or you could completely miss it. Um, that's kind of where we were headed with Raphael. And that version you saw beforehand was actually the third version, uh, which hasn't been made yet, but uh, we went through and did the design uh, a couple of years ago. And that's where that was. All right, so uh, the Charlie Humanoid Robot. Now, if I can actually, hold on, let me pull up the, the video presentation. This is a lot sweeter. So this guy right here, his name is uh, Jake Won Han. He, he's from Korea, um, Seoul, Korea, actually. Um, he worked for the company that makes the servo motors that we use for about 10 years. Um, and when we developed these robots uh, in America, the first couple ones, this is the first one back here, and they actually developed a second one that won. The whole point of these robots was to play in this robot soccer competition called RoboCup. 
So you think, oh, it's robot sucker? Yeah, it, it is. The whole point of RoboCup is to beat humans by 2050. Uh, beat. So they want to wait until um, they want to wait until the World Cup team wins in 2050, and then challenge them with robots afterwards and beat them. But not like into a pulp. I mean, that'd be very, that'd be very easy. Uh, you'd be surprised. The the. These particular robots use what's called lithium polymer batteries, which have a very high current discharge rate. So they can put out uh, on the order of 400 amps in a second at like 28 volts, which is way more than it, you need to kill you. So they're a little dangerous in terms of the electrical systems. If they manage to uh, cut one of their own wires, you can, it can electrify the frame, and you have to be kind of careful <laughs> not to touch it when it, when it does that. Uh, the other thing is the servo motors put out a lot of torque. Uh, the EX106 has put out 106, I want to say kilogram newtons, no, it's gram newtons, uh, 106 gram newtons of, uh, sorry, that's wrong, um, hold on, kilogram meters, that's the one, thank you. Anyway, uh, they put out 106 kilogram meters of, of uh, torque, and they can basically cut your fingers off if you put your finger in the, the so we use a parallel four bar linkage on our, on our bottom, uh, the bottom portion of the robot, that allows it to stand up and sit down. We have a spring that goes across that linkage, and that basically allows it to be uh, at neutral in a neutral energy state when it's standing up. Uh, most robots, you actually have to apply torque to the knee motors to keep them standing upright. Uh, and, and the issue with that is you, you burn out your motors a lot faster. Uh, so basically, we decided to throw a, a four-bar link in there, and then put a spring across it that would keep it uh, standing vertically. Um, so we could we got run times of about 30 minutes. Uh, most humanoids. Um, like, like Osimo, for example, have what's called a harmonic drive in the knee that can put out really high torque. Uh, it uses a really high frequency motor uh, that, that runs at very high RPMs and has a very like very small gear teeth in, a, in an elliptical gear shape. And what that allows you to do is put out really high torques really fast. Uh, you can you can you can have very high loop rates so that you, you can adjust to the ground condition underneath your feet. Um, the real issue with them is the gear teeth are so small. They're made out of very uh, high strength and hardened steel that's kind of brittle. So if you push Osmo over, uh, which you don't see them demonstrate for a reason, um, it'll actually break most of the harmonic drives in the legs and you're out about 40 grand every time it falls over. So they're very careful to make sure it doesn't fall over. Um, with the servo motors that we use, you can push it over all you want. Um, it'll probably break if you do it enough, but it only costs about 500 bucks to replace the motors, so you're not out. 40 grand every time that happens. That's one of the reasons why you don't see a lot of um, you don't see a lot of robots like this walking around on grass or walking out in like a dirty environment. It's because though they're they're specifically designed to walk on flat surfaces, but they don't want to risk walking on another surface because of how much it costs to replace everything and how much trouble it is to. So moving towards a more robust architecture is something that. Um, humanoid robots have had a really hard time doing uh, because they're more fo they're more focused on being able to replicate uh, what humans can do. They're not so much focused on coming up with a robust humanoid. And I think if we drive towards that uh, design goal of, of making it a very robust system, it's a lot easier to work back to doing complex tasks that humans can do. Um, so basically, you know, if you, if you make something beefy enough, then you can go back and do stupid stuff with it without worrying about breaking it. Um, and th that's one thing that, that you, you'll find in research is no normally not very important. All right, so uh, just what I wanted, kind of some design things I wanted to go over. Uh, process is very important in design. Um, when, you're, when you go about designing something, um, the, the most, you, uh, normally you want to brainstorm everything right when you start. Um, and one of the, the, the biggest things that people fail to do in the design process, at least that I've seen in industry, is take a minute and think of all the possibilities. Um, a lot of times the really stupid ideas are the cool one that ends up working out the best. Um, and you, you, can't, you can't shoot people down right off the bat when, when you're coming up with ideas. Um, a lot of stuff in our design actually uh, came from, from ideas like that. For example, uh, most humanoids don't have a, a, a spine that's similar to a human. Uh, that a human would, but ours actually has two carbon fiber rods that run up the spine, and we um, we were working on a system where you could actually um, have plates that you can adjust and you can bend the spine. Uh, that's something that normally, uh, if you look at like a Hubo or an Osimo, 
they have one degree of freedom at the waist, so they can their whole upper body can do this guy, but it can actually like rotate all the way around, which is kind of creepy. Um, <laughs> but kind of exorcist, yeah, exorcist, exactly. Um, the, the heads can go all the way around too. You can do weird stuff like that. But um, with ours, we wanted to have a flexible spine so that you could actually, when you when you're trying to like say the robot's trying to work on a table that's in front of it, well. If you have a stiff spine, you walk up to that table, if your arm's not long enough, you're, you're done. Like, you have to bend at the knees and do this whole thing. But if, if you have a flexible spine, you can actually lean over the table and pick things up. Um, adding those degrees of freedom, though, uh, creates more of a challenge when you, when you go to interact with the objects. Because um, you, you really only have so much certainty over where your end effector is. And if you don't have a very stiff kinematic chain to the ground, you, you accumulate a lot of error in where your hand is. So um, you think your hand is over here, when in fact it's about four inches lower because there was about an inch tolerance difference somewhere in the waist, uh, you start to run into error accumulation issues. And where you can account for that actually is in the vision system. Um, we actually had a, an interesting thing where we put little markers on the hands and you could, you could use the vision system because you know the distance between your um, actuators here and where your eyes are. And you can use the vision system to figure out the difference um, and then to determine where your hand is. Um, so little tricks like that um, come out of taking a long time to think about ways you can do things and, and you know, spending a lot of time beforehand before you go in to start building stuff. Um, so there, let's go to the next slide. Ninety percent is good enough. Uh, this, is, this is true and we found this in many of our uh, endeavors. When you're, when you're looking to, to make a robotic system uh, in, in today, no, this day and age, most of the science is there. Um, a lot of people have done this already. Which is, you know, it shouldn't be discouraging because, honestly, there's so many new technologies out there, uh, and this is true in space too, that taking another look at it, you can do a lot more with a lot less. Um, in, in our case, this is the this is the Osmo history right here. It started out as legs, and then they added bigger and bigger boxes until even that huge box there. Then they started making it smaller. Um, like I said, 200 million dollars across this line right here. That's 20,000, that's about 200, and this is about 20,000. This is called the shadow robot hand. This is actually a, a very interesting hand. It uses these things called McKibben muscles, which are a, a novel uh, pneumatic actuator that basically is a piece of surgical tubing inside a cable sheet. When you inflate the tubing, it contracts. The cable sheet, as it expands, also contracts linearly, and you get linear actuation out of them just by, uh, by inflating them. Really cool. Um, the issue with this hand in particular, though, since you have this huge bundle of actuators back here, and this is actually one of the bigger problems with robotic hands in general, you have huge uh, numbers of actuators in the wrist area, and you can't put other things like batteries or actuators for the arm itself in the, in the forearm region. You're, you're basically, you've devoted that entirely to actuators. Um, if you look at something like a Robonaut, uh, that's a good example uh, where, where they use a lot of, actua a lot of linear actuators in, in the wrist region and then they use a tendon structure to actuate the hand. So in a human hand, that's, that's the way your hand works. Uh, all your arm muscles uh, basically pull on tendons that make your fingers go. Uh, we kind of threw that idea out the window and put our actuators right inside our fingers. Now, that doesn't perfectly mimic a human hand, but the cool thing is, and you couldn't really do this with your hands, uh, but we can with ours. If you pop a finger off, you break a finger off, you can just stick a new one on there. Um, that doesn't really work for your fingers because your tendons off. Uh, but with ours, it's not that big of an issue. Um, another really uh, big problem with these particular hands is there's so many um, there's so many cabling cables that run through here that you can move into toggle modes, which is where if your hand is in a certain position, you can actually like accidentally pull on a cable that you don't want to pull on, and like cause your fingers to to grasp together when you move your hand the wrong way. Um, that's actually true with your hands too. You can only you can only move your fingers in certain uh, modes when you're like moving your wrist around. Like you can't move your wrist. You don't get the same range of motion uh, if you have your wrist in certain positions and you go to move your fingers. Um, it's pretty interesting. But yeah, so so that was one of the things that, that we kind of were excited about in our design there. Um, so 90% good enough. Uh, keep it simple, stupid. So this, the first version of our hand was, was dumb easy. Um, but the cool thing about it being dumb easy is it, it still, um, it was very robust. Uh, this particular version is submergible. Uh, you, can, you can put it on high electricity wires and you don't have issues. Um, there's all sorts of crap that's really cool about it. <laughs> um, another particular thing, 
Um, it'll run on shop air. So if you put it in, a, in an industrial <coughs> environment, you can plug it right into systems that already exist. Um, and it runs the same as, as any other shop tool would. Um, so, so keeping things simple is normally advantageous to design. Uh, you, you never really want to add overdue complexity if you don't need to. Um, another great example of that, these little things right here are rubber bands. Uh, we call them elastic ligaments, but it's the same thing. Uh, culture affects design. Now this is really huge. Um, having people who are willing to spend the put in the time and, and be around all the time, like a core team, that, that's really, I think, the biggest thing that uh, gets you well-designed and working systems. Um, these guys here are all from the lab that I worked in, uh, just as an example. But um, you, you see this robot in the middle? That's called a Jamie Hubo. Uh, they cost about a million dollars, and uh, the university, a Heist University sells them. Um, so these are little mini Hubos that we designed in our lab. But uh, you, you find that interacting with people from other cultures often gives you good perspective on what you're designing and having a, a very you know family-like environment normally gives you better uh, better success moving forward you, you really have to consider your environment when you're designing stuff uh, because it really affects the way your designs come out um, Kyle? yes um, we're gonna move on to questions from the audience oh word questions from the audience Oh, fine. Uh, you're from SpaceX, so the obvious question would yes. be, uh, do you guys, are you guys looking for ways to do space assemblers with this, uh, and how far are we from being able to, let's say, robotically assemble something or other space station? So, uh, things like robotically assembling space stations. There's actually some really awesome work uh, right now on uh, docking connections. Um, there's something called a Stuart platform, which is a six actuation uh, it basically uses six actuators, it's a parallel mechanism, uh, and NASA did a pretty cool, interesting study on making a low impact docking connector, where um, they have this ring that basically extends out from the object that's docking, and matches the orientation and direction of the, of the you know, connector it's going to on the ISS, um, and they can use closed loop control to actually figure out like the velocity that's coming in at, and kind of damp out the, the collision uh, Data. But, but yeah, things things like that are definitely uh, starting to come to the forefront in, in design of spacecraft. Have you guys looked at like robotic assembly of such stuff? So uh, on on orbit assembly is definitely a huge uh, field that's coming up more recently. Um, I, I think there's a lot of good research that's going on uh, in in labs like this that um, kind of lend them lend itself to, to that. But uh, as for right now, in terms of SpaceX. I don't really know if we have anything going on that right now. We're, we're really focused on getting the rockets up. Uh, getting stuff to space is kind of key to developing things in space. <laughs> what are your thoughts on that robot dog by uh, Boston? Are you talking about Big, Big Dog? Yeah, Big Dog. Big Dog's pretty awesome. Uh, Big Dog is, is a really great demonstration of closed loop controls. Um, it basically has a, a hydraulic power unit that powers these big hydraulic actuators that are in its legs. And it, it's got um, really great stability. It can walk in pretty much any terrain. I know you're trying to cut me off. Awesome. Yeah. Kyle. I'm the <laughs>